Good afternoon, everyone. Very nice to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, in rather uh, abstract, somebody who'd seen my paper said rather philosophical terms today. So I hope it actually turns out to be useful because as you'll see, I'm a bit of an interloper into this group. I think you'll understand what I mean in a minute. But what I would like to do is to suggest that we could begin by discussing four propositions. And these propositions are in order to frame how I think we can integrate culture with heritage in the way that the, the film outlined and, and Corinne's introduction uh, gave us uh, an insight so well. And the first of these propositions is that heritage must be understood, can only be understood in its cultural, political, economic, and social context. Now that seems very obvious, but some of the things I hope to say may illustrate why this may not be quite so obvious. Uh, the second one is that disasters must be understood as being socially constructed and therefore also in their cultural, political, economic and social con context. And this may seem uh, rather a strange statement, but if you can imagine it's socially constructed in the sense that you have a natural hazard, which is of course provided by uh, nature, but the reason that that might or might not cause a disaster is entirely within the realm of economics, politics, and culture, and social processes. Um, and a very simplistic example of this is, is a hurricane in the Caribbean, which visits three different countries. It, and this has actually been looked at. Um, first, it hits Cuba and kills nobody, does a lot of damage to housing, and people are crammed into the remaining housing. It hits Haiti and kills hundreds of people. And then it hits Florida and kills nobody, but does hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. Exactly the same hazard, but three different outcomes. And whether or not it is a disaster and what kind of disaster is constructed by the social, economic, cultural, and social con um, context in which that hazard operates. In other words, it is the, the action of the two together which we need to understand. Then the third proposition is that disasters must be related to the culture of the peoples that they happen to, and that the organizational culture of those who deal with the disasters, two kinds of cultures here, people's culture and organizational culture. And one of the complicating factors is relating to people's culture is that very often there's more than one in any place that is hit by a disaster, or especially a conflict. One of the reasons that we have conflicts is because there is com com contradictory um, contesting cultures going on in the same location. But this can also happen with um, uh, natural hazards as well. And then the fourth one is that your expertise can help with the DRR, this is the disaster risk reduction organizations around the world, which stretch from the UN system down to um, NGOs, international NGOs, local NGOs, other UN, uh, sorry, other international agencies. Your expertise, the people in the room here, can help those organizations to deal with these issues because in those organizations, culture is largely ignored. And so what I hear, what I feel I can help with is propositions two and three. I can do much less in one and four, which is where um, perhaps your expertise uh, um, and excitement lies. Uh, because I'm not a cultural heritage specialist, I work on disaster risk reduction and in particular on the vulnerability factors that make disasters happen. In other words, what is it about the vulnerable conditions of people and human systems that makes a disaster happen when a, when a hurricane or an earthquake comes along? And with a group of other people, we've held two conferences on this and produced a couple of books, which I'll uh, show you in a minute, just so you're aware of them. Um, and um, so I'll show you those now. Um, the first book was the annual International Red Cross book, the World Disasters Report, which is on the focused on culture and risk. There will be a few copies of this available at this conference. Not enough for everybody, I'm afraid, but for those who are particularly interested, you'll be able to get a, a, a copy later on. And in this book, we an, an, analyze two forms of culture. One is people's culture. So for example, many of you will have seen in the press a few months ago that uh, there was an earthquake in Malaysia which was caused by some tourists taking their clothes off. 
Some of you saw that? Okay. And in, um, in Java, Indonesia, um, on a very dangerous volcano called Merapi, there are spirit guardians who commune with the god of the volcano and with other spirits that are like animals that run around the volcano. And the spirit guardian enables people to feel safe or not feel safe. And when the volcano is likely to erupt, the spirit guardian, he will issue a warning or not. And in 2010, there was an eruption in which he died because he said, it's fine, the god of the volcano is happy. Um, we're not going to die. We're going to be safe. And these stories of people's relationship, their cultural relationship to risk is common throughout the world. And it's somewhat surprising then that al almost all organizations that deal with disasters in the world, NGOs up to the UN system, completely ignore culture in relation to people's attitudes to risk. And so that's one thing that we wanted to do in this book, which was to highlight that. Then, of course, the next thing we needed to do was to understand, well, why are they not, why are they ignoring this? What is it about their institutional culture that means they ignore evidence? Because they would all claim to be scientists or social scientists, and yet they're ignoring a huge body of evidence which says they are not getting it right. So we uh, analyzed their, um, that uh, as well. And then the second book, which is a more academic book, has come out of these conferences as well. Um, there'll be flyers for that tomorrow if you want to pick that up. And the painting on the front is actually from an art project in Haiti, which was part of a, a recovery project to support artists in uh, using uh, culture as part of the rest restoration process. How did we define culture in, the, in these conferences and in our, uh, in our research? Our approach to this was to say we were going to be very pragmatic because culture is so complicated, so complex, that it's extremely difficult to do it in great detail. Um, so we took a very pragmatic issue on this and we said we're going to be interested in the culture as it relates to disasters, as it relates to people's perception of risk. And we had a four-stage process. We first tried to understand what are people's beliefs, which are acquired, of course, through upbringing, family, education, religious institutions within which you live and grow up. And that these beliefs then lead to values, the values which give priority in different people's lives. For example, in many parts of the world, culture gives females lower um, value than males. Uh, and this is one of the common features that we find very difficult to deal with. Um, but this actually has an impact on disasters. For example, in cyclones in South Asia, females are far more likely to die with children that they're caring for than males. And that is precisely a result of the way in which females are not allowed to move out of the house without permission and so on. I don't have time to go into detail, maybe we can come back to discussion. But the values arise from the beliefs which are part of the cultural system. And these values then lead to attitudes. What is your perception of risk? How do you actually, uh, what do you perceive as a risk? Uh, Valdinsky, who's done quite a lot of work on culture and risk, actually says that there is an issue of what do people choose to fear? And culture is part of the, part of the background in which people decide what is going to be their fear. And you see this in Western countries in, as well. It, it, for example, some people believe that people have irrational fear of nuclear energy. Um, and th that it is, in fact, you know, much, can be argued to be much safer than other forms of energy. But th we choose to fear certain things because of background uh, beliefs and so on. And then attitudes lead to behaviors. How do we operationalize culture in the way in which we actually act or do not act in relation to different kinds of risks? So this is the kind of framing which maybe is useful also to use in terms of tangible, intangible um, culture in relation to heritage. So the first um, of our, uh, um, uh, um, uh, my propositions then, is that heritage must be understood in its cultural, political, economic, and societal context. In other words, in the context of everything, which of course is extremely difficult because uh, it's a hard task to do all that. Um, but understanding uh, the social construction of disasters and the significance of different actors, I believe, can help us to do the cultural protection, the protection of cultural heritage. Um, and I think that this is important because um, if we're looking at people who hold power in different parts of the world, 
why would we expect them to protect heritage when they're not acting the proper way to deal with disaster prevention in general, prevention of damage to their own people and their own um, um, economic uh, um, systems. So I think that if we understand heritage in this wider um, economic, political, cultural system, we will get a better handle on how to understand what is going on with heritage. Now, um, the background to this comes out of an argument of the social construction of disasters. And I'm, I'm not trying to promote this book at all, but um, we get no money for it. The money goes to Oxfam. But the first three chapters are actually free on the UN uh, ISDR website. There you'll be able to access it if you want. And this is part of a movement over the last 30 years. The first edition of this came out in 94 in which we argue that disasters are socially constructed, they are not a product of nature. And the, the point of doing that is to understand that if we want to do something about disasters, it is about reducing vulnerability. It isn't about the hazard, it is about the socioeconomic system that gives rise to the vulnerability of the people and the, social, uh, the human systems that are affected. So the ob object of it is to push much more resources into dealing with pre-disaster vulnerability, reducing that vulnerability, and uh, um, emphasizing that um, uh, preparedness. And the main framework that we, uh, sorry, before I go on to that, another aspect of, of cultural, organizational cultural problems is that many organizations actually um, misunderstand what people fear. Because all over the world, hardly anyone, when you ask them, are they worried about earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, whatever, hardly ever do they say that's their primary problem. So what we find is that this is a sort of a normal curve push, pushed into a triangle. At the top, you've got um, extremely rare but very intense in events. And at the bottom, you've got more frequent, um, less intense events. And, um, so those happen much more, people get used to them. People live with floods and so on. People live with drought. And at the top here, you could argue that the people see these as being something that you could do very little about, these extreme events. And this is where you find religious or cultural explanations of the, um, the disaster where people do not feel they can do very much about it. At the bottom, people live with these hazards, but none of these come up in people's lists of concerns. And this is repeated all over the world in surveys that have been done. Um, at the bottom, what people say they're worried about, their priorities, is the problems of everyday life. Food on the plate, paying school fees for next term, illness, traffic accidents, water supply, malaria, and so on. And, and this is a very, very common pattern. And also is another aspect of organizational culture which is largely ignored. Organizations believe that people want them to help save them from earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, and hurricanes. But actually, people want these things, the everyday needs. And, and this means for the heritage, the message here for the heritage sector is that it's going to be difficult, it, it is difficult, to actually get people to take heritage issues seriously when they're threatened by a serious natural hazard because people are not taking them seriously in any case themselves. And the way in which we analyze the social construction of risk is through this, this model, this framework, which is called, the nickname is called the crunch model, pressure and release model, in which you, of course, have the disaster, which happens, which arises, is triggered by the natural hazard. But what we need to understand is that you've got the vulnerability component as well. And what is it that causes that vulnerability? You can see that they all arise out of the social, economic, and political system. So the crunch is when these two things hit. And you only get a disaster if the hazard on that side actually meets with people who are vulnerable on this side. If the people are not vulnerable, if the arrow points the other way, the release part of the model, then you don't have a disaster. It's a, it's a um, Cuba or Florida situation, not a Haiti situation. But the, the next step is actually that we need to explain what is this vulnerability, where does it come from? And in this social construction approach, this paradigm, it's explained through power systems and, and the, for example, the framework, the social framework of class, gender, ethnicity, class, and culture should be in there as well. 
And this then needs to be explained. And we go back to root causes, which are way remote from the actual um, disaster itself. The root causes, way back here in power relationships at the global and national level, conflicts, war, and of course, in there is climate change. Under the debt crisis, um, it's interesting that Haiti was paying reparations to France until the 1940s for the, repay, uh, for the compensation of slave owners from the revolution in the 1820s. This was still going on 120 years later. A minor part of their debt crisis, but um, interesting part of the social understanding of what's going on. So this crunch model, which is in that book that I mentioned, and I'm going to try to reconstruct this around heritage in a minute, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to rush through. I'm very sorry I have to rush through some of these. But I wanted to um, point out that um, heritage, understood in its social context, in its wider context, um, we can also understand it as being important for reconstructing people's lives afterwards. Um, this is an example from in on the coast of Japan, where people had reorganized children into um, um, dance groups, um, using music as a way of focusing around reconstruction of their lives and dealing with grief um, in this area. And in, in La Paz, um, the, the interesting point about this festival, as you can see it's an indigenous people's festival, is that it, the people will spend far more time and effort on this festival, which reinforces their social capital, their interrelationships with each other, than they do on disaster preparedness. And you'll understand why I think disaster preparedness for them is quite important and why they put more emphasis on culture is interesting because they live in places like that and like that. And it gets worse because those, you can see these are not poor people. They put quite a significant investment into these houses and like that. And Fabian Nathan, who took these photos and did his PhD on this, interviewed people in these houses and when he interviewed them, they all gave perfectly good reasons. Those are the same houses from a different angle. Those are extra. This is in the Red Cross book, by the way. It's a case study there. They all gave very rational, logical reasons why they want to stay there and stay there, not move. They think they're going to get more services. And to outsiders and him when he first arrived, it looked completely crazy, which I'm sure it does to you all. But they had constructed stories based, rooted around their culture, beliefs, which enabled them to stay there. Um, disasters, my second proposition, that disasters must be understood as being socially constructed and therefore also in their political blah, 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 you'll get fed up with me saying all those words, okay, everything, uh, must be understood in the context of everything. Um, so um, it's, it's um, an important point to, that we have to do this because otherwise we, we get it wrong. Now, um, I'm illustrating this. I am rushing a bit now, but I think the slides will be available with the comments, the notes underneath. So um, the point I'm making about these slides, which are in Japan, is that the protection of cultural heritage in Japan is partly done by um, local protection committees. And my question for that is, some of them are operating on the basis that their heritage is linked to the survival of the temple. They get an income from the, the livelihood activities that go around the temple. Would they do it without that? Would they do it just because they believe in it? So we need to be thinking about what are the ways in which we can preserve culture and also deal with the fact that there are many different ideas of what is worth preserving. So these are just some wacky uh, examples um, to throw at you. Disasters must relate to the culture of the people, but whose culture? Um, this some of you might recognize as being El Dorado, or it's thought to be El Dorado, uh, from the Museum of Gold in Bogota. And these beautiful objects, of which there were many, were fashioned out of gold by the different indigenous groups in the Americas. And when the Spanish got there, they thought, oh, that's gold, that's nice, melted them down into ingots and shipped them back to Spain, and destroyed them, in other words. The, the, the culture was destroyed in order to have the value of the thing. But they found out that the Indians' risk reduction management were using them as part of offerings to mountain gods, and they would be thrown into lakes. So this lake, which used to be up to this height, was cut through at this point by Spanish and other adventurers in order to try to drain 
to drain the, uh, that's my timer telling me my time's up. So I'll, I'll try to be very, very quick. Uh, maybe take another three minutes. I, I, know, I know that's bad. Uh, I'll try and rush. But, but the point is that who, when we have multiple cultures in a place and power is invested in some cultures and not others, how is it decided which ones have validity and which ones should be preserved? Then the fourth um, one where you can help an awful lot because DRR organizations largely ignore culture is that we can also begin to understand, and you would have insights into this, is how is culture damaged in the process of reconstruction um, after, after a disaster. For example, in the Nicobar Islands, there's an excellent case study here from the New Scientist of all places. There's a ritual going on here amongst the indigenous people in this is off the coast of um, India, between India and Burma, um, severely damaged many uh, by the tsunami 2004. Uh, their culture is being completely destroyed by the aid and recovery process and um, completely undermined entirely the way that the people live and relate to one another. So what goes on there? Um, this is highly contentious, and I, I'm in the wrong room to say this, but um, interesting about the... Um, the uh, the statues in Afghanistan which were destroyed, when they were destroyed, 53 caves were discovered which had never been known about, which had other remnants in them. But the interesting point here for, for us to think about is that the, the Taliban leader who ordered their destruction said afterwards, he, of course he may have invented this for other political purposes, said that the, um, he was angry at a, a, a heritage group that wanted to come and help to restore the um, uh, statues and he destroyed them because he felt that they were more concerned about the statues than about people, children who were starving in Afghanistan and so it was a kind of revenge uh, another kind of revenge on the west for that and of course we have the other problem which is that what is the balance between the different causes of damage to heritage is it um, uh, governments, is it corporations, is it freelance operators, here is the much bigger Buddhist site at Masayak, Anak, which is likely to be completely destroyed by a copper mine in the coming years. And um, so, so the issue is, who, uh, who is doing most of the cause of the damage? Is it disasters, conflicts, or is it what's going on already? Now, I'm going to have to skip over these next slides. You can read them for yourself if you like. They are examples of where I think there is dual standards going on. For example, the British Museum here was sponsored its Aboriginal uh, um, exhibition by British Petroleum. Now, uh, British Petroleum doesn't have a good track record in the United States, but BP and other oil companies are um, implicated in the destruction of cultures all around the world, but here they are giving money to the British Museum um, for uh, preserving Aboriginal culture. And then uh, I am going to have to stop, but, but those of you who want to look at my slides, I think they'll be there for you to look at. I bring in Ai Weiwei, of all people, because I think he's done a very interesting thing about um, cultural heritage, protecting cultural heritage in a strange way, because he has done this installation on the Sichuan earthquake, which I think preserves culture in a particular way. First of all, he's straightened out all those reinforcement bars which killed 5,000 ch children because they were not installed correctly in corruptly constructed buildings, and the 5,000 names of the children which his supporters collected and are painted on the wall there, we have this very powerful statement about um, what is cultural heritage. And he's making it clear to us that there are two aspects of Chinese culture which are not conducive to disaster pre pre preparedness or restoration. And, and I think it's fascinating that the, the rebars, the, uh, the steel bars there, resemble both seismic waves of the, the, the land when the earthquake happens, and if you look down on it, it looks like a, seismic, a seismograph, uh, the actual printout of a seismograph. So I think this is a very powerful statement. But I've, uh, I'll skip through these. What I've done is to do a first cut at a pressure and release model for cultural heritage. So we've got the standard hazards there on the right, and I'm wondering whether the vulnerability is over um, the poor condition of um, heritage here, I'm talking about uh, um, tangible heritage, air pollution is a major problem, low maintenance visitor damage, not hazard proof or climate proof for climate change, 
So the issue is what are the social structures that lead to this neglect, um, inadequate funding and so on. So this is just a first cut of a framework which I hope may be helpful for you to be thinking about. And of course we go back to almost identically the same um, national and international political economy factors as the root causes of those neglect and um, problems and um, uh, cultural uh, differences and discriminations. And so this may be something you find useful to, to look at and fill, fill that out a bit more. But I think out of this, um, climate change is something that we may want to emphasize because climate change is going to magnify the, uh, some of the hazards on the right-hand side and is going to be a major driver of poverty and lack of funding in the middle of the diagram there. And just so that we have some sense of this, people telling themselves that they're safe but living in dangerous circumstances Thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce my discussant, Stefan Simon, while I have to sit in the hot chair. And then after uh, Stefan has spoken, we have time for questions. Thank you, Terry. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here at the Smithsonian. Again, just a month after we had another very interesting event here, not far on the other side of the mall, a similar topic. It's also an honor and pleasure to respond to Terry Cannon's presentation, author of the World Disaster Report 2014. I think um, looking through his paper, the key message probably is that disasters are a social construction or a social construct. Uh, that there are political, economic, and social processes which create disaster, creating disaster by determining vulnerability of the societies. And actually, at the very end of his presentation, he presented what he calls the crunch of a pressure and relax model, um, the, illustrating this causal web between exposure towards hazards and intrinsic vulnerability of societies and also of cultural heritage. As, a, as an educated chemist, it's a little bit difficult for me to, to repeat that sentence. Disasters are a social construction because I learned for like 30 years about materials, mortars, compressive strength, um, <laughs> tensile strength. Uh, but I, I, I cannot deny that there is a lot of truth in that sentence. And, um, and I think we have really to look at that and we have to establish this balance as Terry was showing. Can we either mitigate hazards or can we reduce vulnerability um, with this model which he was proposing in his presentation. And th this goes down to a discussion on values and significance. And at some point Terry was asking what, what actually heritage is giving as value to ordinary people. And I think those of us who work in the preservation of cultural heritage, they, they learned, I mean, we all learned over the past 150 years since the time of Ruskin and Alois Riegel that we have to deal with a multitude of values. We have not only one kind of value. In, in the international charter is most uh, impressive probably the Nara Charter, which illustrate that, um, that it's very important to identify first as a first step and then include the stakeholders in, in, in establishing actually these values and, and the significance of cultural heritage. And, and there are good examples out there. There, there. there are projects in Australia, the Significance Project, in Denmark, uh, in Netherlands, the, the Delta Plan. Um, and I would like to mention, of course, also the, the, the real great work which is done by IGOs like ICROM, I think a partner is here today, um, this organization is an intergovernmental organization with uh, 140 member states. Yeah, so, and, and, and doing a great deal of work to, to emphasize or to promote a discussion on values and, and significance for cultural heritage. Because including stakeholders and including the society in this discussion is actually a crucial element, also in my opinion, a crucial element in achieving sustainable sustainability in conservation, achieving a sustainable conservation model. One question which was raised by Terry was, 
how to seek help for heritage in the face of human suffering. Um, and I think it's kind of a legitimate question when you look at 4 million refugees from Syria and 200, more than 200,000 people killed in this conflict over the past uh, three years. Um, and it's a question which comes up very often also in discussions uh, with us. But I think this is not an either or question. I, I apologize if that is not finding acceptance in the audience, but I have a very strong opinion that this is not an either or question. Actually, as Corey has said in the introductory video, you cannot separate cultural heritage from the people. I really believe that is the case. And um, we, we could mention a lot of examples after natural and man-made disasters where recovery efforts, where reconstruction, but also preservation efforts help tremendously to the people to regain dignity, to strengthen the civil society. Um, just one example um, from my uh, background in, in Poland, uh, rebuilding Warsaw after the Second World War and the destruction by the German army um, was a decision for regaining national dignity. There was a debate whether to move the capital down to Krakow, where it was 400 years before, uh, but it was really rebuilt out of nothing. And, and, and it's also linked to, actually to the, to the foundation of e-commerce in 1964, uh, the city of Warsaw. So one point which I would like to, to um, shed some light in, in a, in a, as a question is, if we talk about reducing vulnerability, we can also discuss about reducing hazards. And I mean, just to maybe put it, push it over the limit a little bit, if we understand as, um, Terry is saying everything in the context of everything. Um, if we th think about th this, these interrelations and connections, one could say, you know, at least to Europe, exporting weapons means harvesting refugees. It's an experience which we now make, I mean, in Europe, in my home city of Munich, where we have approximately 10, 15,000 people coming every day. Um, and if you look at hazard reduction, in this interrelation, we, we, we can look at how, I mean, as an example, and on the ongoing looting, which is, as, as Irina Bokova, Director General of UNESCO, is saying, is going on now in the Middle East on a, on a quasi-industrial scale. Um, I believe that the stakeholders of the trade, they need to really exercise due diligence, they need to, uh, the dealers, the collectors, the museums, they can care much more about the provenance than they actually do or did in the past. Uh, a lot of organizations have, have spoken out clearly on that. You know, also the United, United Nations Security Council with the resolution 2199 and early this year. Um, I also think that a point raised by Terry on why is cultural heritage not so much included in in the work of these DRR organizations, in the work also of you know, United Nations. Um, I think this is really a problem. I, I always wonder why, for example, the OECD mission in Ukraine doesn't have a, a cultural component. Um, I think this is something to, to, to think a little bit more about that. And of course, last but not least, uh, from the perspective of the universities and from the academic world, I think, and, and that comes back to the, to the um, observation that disaster is a, is a social construction. Um, we should make more efforts to understand actually this, what, what is it, this phenomena of cultural cleansing we are observing? What, what is behind that? And that's very far from chemistry, I have to admit. Very far from chemistry. Um, why cultural heritage seems to have become a primary target in conflicts. Um, I mean, it has been like this, it's not the first time, but it seems that the extent of destruction is, is, is really massive over the past, past year. I usually say this is the worst year in my career to preserve cultural heritage. I'm not sure how often I will have to repeat that sentence in the future, but um, starting out from, from the, the war in Bosnia where we saw, you know, uh, primarily directed destruction of orthodox monasteries, churches, and mosques. Um, I think we, 
we see now, whether we look at the Boko Haram in Nigeria, whether we look uh, what ISIS is gonna, gonna do, hopefully not, but maybe in Libya, when we look at what the Saudi Air Force is doing on World Heritage cities like Sana'a in Yemen, and when we follow, and I know my colleagues at the Smithsonian are, are also in close contact with um, our colleagues on the ground in Syria, um, people like Director General of the DGAM, Mamoun Abdul Karim, uh, who, who are really these true heroes of our time in the first line to defend cultural heritage, um, is really the question, how can we, at university level, study this phenomena of cultural cleaning, cleansing, and how can we maybe be more supportive more generous, more innovative in our support to our colleagues on the ground. Thank you. We have a system in which I field the questions myself, which means I'm only going to take questions from people who were nodding vigorously when I was speaking. So, <laughs> so please. Put your hands up. I can't see anything because these lights are so bright, but I hope I managed to see hands uh, from people who would like to say something. Not just questions, comments, I'm sure, are fine. And I'd like to uh, make a couple of comments uh, about your Afghan examples. Uh, one, of course, is uh, the Bamiyan Buddhas, uh, in which you indicate that uh, because of the destruction of the Buddhas, there were additional niches found uh, within, uh, within the uh, larger niches of the two uh, Buddhas. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that because the Japanese had already done a fairly substantial assessment of all the niches which are polychrome painted and which contain manuscripts. It was kind of like a library. And so I'm not quite sure that much more was discovered. Okay. A good deal was known. Unfortunately, much of it is uh, published in Japanese, but nonetheless, it was done. The second example is uh, Masainak. Uh, the Buddhist site, uh, which has some Hellenistic materials under it, uh, that all sits on top of uh, one of the world's largest copper mines, uh, or copper deposits, I should say, that was exploited originally by the Kushan peoples uh, uh, back around 300 uh, uh, CE. Uh, I doubt, and this is my own opinion, that uh, much is going to happen in terms of the destruction of the Buddhist materials there. And I'm saying this hopefully, because the area is now totally under control of the Taliban. And the government uh, presence is minimal. Now, uh, the uh, site itself is a huge Buddhist center with lots of stupas. But I think it may survive because the Chinese who held the contract with uh, the Kabul government uh, have kind of lost interest in that site because yes, there are copper deposits and you could mine it, but you'd have to smelt it or to transport the ore out of the country and the Afghan infrastructure, lack of railroads, 13 miles of it, uh, and lack of highways, I think is going to prevent them from doing this. Thank you very the other, much. The other point is, um, I, last I think point, we'll have to take other questions first last, because I think- The point is, there's a larger deposit in Pakistan that the Chinese are much interested in. Right, thank you very much. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Kelly Moore, and I have um, actually just returned from Eastern Ukraine as part of the, I'm back over here, as part of the um, OSCE mission. So I just wanted to comment briefly, this is sort of my own theory, about why you don't see more cultural preservation work being done on the ground in peacekeeping missions or observation missions. And I think part of the reality is just there's simply nobody on the ground to do the work. So, for example, in eastern Ukraine, we had UNHCR. They were present. Um, Doctors Without Borders is present. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is present. UNESCO is not. Um, You see a similar uh, structure in the United Nations. They have rule of law officers, human rights officers, election officers. There are no cultural preservation officers or cultural heritage officers in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations in the United Nations. So I know that it's actually a much more complicated conversation than that, um, but I literally just got back a few days ago, and so just wanted to share my observation that you have a lot of people doing work on the ground, but cultural heritage isn't there because they're just not at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I found your your topic very... Oh, I'm Jessica Johnson, and I'm um, at the Smithsonian with the Museum Conservation Institute, and I'll be presenting later in the session. Um, I found the way you use this this PAR model, PAR model, the crunch model, and started to think about how to apply it to um, cultural heritage very interesting. Has there been... Um, can you talk at all about how it's been used in more traditional DRR to try to get back to stopping some of the, to, to dealing with some of the vulnerabilities by trying to deal with some of the things behind the vulnerabilities? Has mm. that work begun? Have there been successful ways that we might try to learn to use that model um, in our own work? Yeah, thanks, very um, good point. The, that model is certainly used to analyze disasters that have happened. In fact, a num- number of people I know use a blank template of that, give it to students, say, fill it in for a disaster that you know about. And so they work it back from the vulnerable conditions to say, well, what was it that caused those conditions? What were the factors in polit- politics, economics that led, led to that? And uh, so it can be a very good teaching tool for analyzing disasters that have already happened. There's also an organization uh, which is part of ICSU, the International Council for Scientific Unions, which is headquartered in in Beijing. And they are working up uh, a version of this which is called FORIN, F-O-R-I-N, which stands for Forensic Investigation. Again, this is post-disaster. And the idea is that you actually go back through that web of causation to identify, well, what what went wrong, what were the factors that went wrong that caused that to be a worse disaster than it needed to have been. And this is especially valid when when those disasters are predicted. Um, And and many disasters are predicted. The coming earthquake in Istanbul is being worked on, there's World Bank loans for retrofitting, blah, blah, blah. Um, The um, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Everyone knew what was going to happen there, and we had a case study of it in our book, which was published uh, 10 years before the disaster, and and practically everything that was predicted by the specialists happened in that disaster. So it's a way of, um, it is possible to use it for expected disasters as well. So it, it, it should be possible to do that, and I would love to see how you might do that in relation to um, cultural heritage. Um, it's not being used so much for poor predictive work as, as that tool because um, historically it's been used for analyzing afterwards to get people to think about well, what was that web of causation, that chain of causation. Is everyone jet lagged? No. Yeah, here's one. <laughs> Everyone's saying now we won't have such well, a long coffee break. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah Stauberman. I'm at the Hirshhorn Museum, and I, I was interested in your Ai Weiwei um, uh, 
example. Yeah. And I was thinking about um, the four uh, things that lead into cultures and disasters, beliefs, values, attitudes, behaviors that you identified. And, and of course, I, I immediately thought that those were all good things, you know, that, that all of those things come out to, that every culture must share good things about those beliefs, values, attitudes, and behaviors. But then I was thinking about corruption, and we see corruption everywhere, mm -hmm. and um, that we must have, um, that w what is it about what we can encounter as cultural heritage people um, to think about um, the, the role of corruption in creating disasters and in perpetuating them, and is it everywhere? Because of course this is what caused, well, if not corruption, if um, just poor building practices or just sort of a, a, a blatant disregard for what is going to happen. So I'm thinking about corruption and value. Hmm. Thanks, uh, very nice that you engage with those four steps because I think that might be something I, I would love to see you engaging with as a, um, a research um, community to see what, what you think, it, it, does it help to actually identify the stages of intervention that are possible. Um, and, I, and I think that one of the things about values is that you know corruption to one is not corruption to another. So there are different values which derive from different cultures. Um, and what is defined as co uh, corruption depends on, on those backgrounds. I mean, I, I would argue that, that Britain is one of the most corrupt countries in the world, um, but that depends how you define it. What has happened is that the power system has enabled there to be a legal framework which actually legalizes what other people would call corruption. And um, especially in the financial sector, but um, I mean, we could talk about Volkswagen um, here. Um, so that the, the issue about what is called, I mean, the reason that most people are against what we call corruption is for ethical reasons. We think that it is harmful. It is harmful to people, it is harmful and wasteful of resources and, uh, and finance, and it's unfair. It, it redistributes assets in an unfair way. So usually the reason that we're against corruption, despite its pervasiveness, is that we think it's unfair and unethical. But the way in which you define that in law is dependent on the power system that says what is and isn't allowed. And, and that be becomes the big, the big problem. Um, and so I think underlying this is, is that what we have is different definitions of what we mean by what is acceptable culture. So for example, I hinted at it about values that derive from beliefs, including religious beliefs, about the position of females in society. In many cultures around the world, females are, are not regarded as having an equitable place, uh, a, a, a rightful place um, in, in, that, in that society. Um, you know, just outside here, my partner who's here with me and I were absolutely shocked to see the carousel. Her, uh, many of you will know the carousel in the mall, uh, which is this wonderful old fashioned uh, roundabout for uh, children. On, on the side of it is a plaque that said it used to be in Baltimore and that it was, it was um, uh, forbidden for black children to ride on it. And, and the first black child who rode on it was 1963. Uh, and, and this is just, you know, on our doorstep. And I'm not making an anti-American point here. I could talk about Britain if you want until um, uh, um, the cows come home. Um, and so the, the point is that many of these definitions of what is and is not ethical and what is considered to be corruption come from the power system and the cultural systems and where they clash. And um, many of the problems is where the people, people's culture is not universal. So, and this is particularly the case in, in conflicts where there are different definitions of what is acceptable. So the, the Afghan story is that um, it's not acceptable to have Buddhist statues in an Islamic country. Um, well, that, that's whose culture are you going to support? Which one is the one that you, you want? And then, of course, embedded in that is what you might call corruption or hypocrisy, where you've got ISIS um, blowing up uh, Palmyra large monuments but selling portable ones on the black market to get their money. So you have uh, hugely uh, contradictory things going on 
Um, so are they really against paganism? Or are they really just wanting to stick two fingers up? Well, actually, in America, it's one finger. Up at the, sorry, this is webcast, sorry. <laughs> Uh, at, at, the, uh, at the West um, for what they regard as interference in their culture. So, Corey, are you wanting to move on because the yeah, time's... Yeah, okay. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks so much.